One of America's most incredible national parks sits on the border of Montana and Canada. It's called Glacier National Park. Giant cliffs of sedimentary rock rise thousands of feet high. How did the rocks form? And what processes carved these giant valleys? Secular scientists say these rocks are over 1.6 billion years old and contain stromatolites built by microbes supposed to have formed over a billion years ago, according to evolution. They also say many ice ages over millions of years carved these valleys. Yet there are over 60 ideas about how the ice age formed and melted, showing secular scientists really don't have any one theory that works well with the evidence. Some people doubt there was an ice age, but the evidence is all around us. The Bible indicates that these rocks were formed quickly during the global flood, which produced the right conditions for one ice age, all happening within the last 4,350 years. This timescale does not match with the billions of years proposed by secular scientists. Which view is correct? And what does the evidence really show? Find out all this and more next on Awesome Science. Awesome Science takes you on a field trip to some of the most amazing geologic and historic sites around the world, where we use the Bible as our history guidebook to interpret what we see, that the Bible can be trusted and empirical science falls in line with the biblical account of creation, the fall, and the flood. Science, it's awesome. The history of this area goes back thousands of years. The earliest inhabitants were American Indians, the Salish, Flathead, Shoshone, and Cheyenne. The anthropologist, historian, and writer George Bird Grinnell called this area the crown of the continent. He made it his life's goal to preserve this beauty for all mankind. But progress came. In 1891, the Great Northern Railway crossed the Continental Divide along the southern boundary of the park. And Swiss-style lodges and chalets were built in this area to portray it as America's Switzerland. In concern that the land would not be exploited for private enterprise, President Taft in 1910 established this area as a national park. The park encompasses over 1.2 million acres with two mountain ranges, over 700 pristine lakes, only 134 named. The deepest is Lake McDonald at 464 feet. The park has over 200 waterfalls, some almost 500 feet tall. Two million visitors come here annually. You can travel by car or by bus through this magnificent scenery. In 1932, work was completed on the Going to the Sun Road, which connects the west and east sides. The road was named after an American Indian legend and is considered an engineering marvel. It was built in the 1930s on sheer cliffs during the short construction seasons, where workers had to build through 60-foot snowdrifts. The highest point of the highway goes over Logan's Pass at 6,646 feet. The road was completed in less than 20 years and cost more than $2 million. Glacier is a part of a large preserved ecosystem known as the crown of the continent ecosystem. There is little to no pollution since there are no major dense human population centers and no factories. It's a great place to observe alpine flora. There are a total of 1,132 plant species found in the valleys and peaks. There are three major climate zones in the park. The east side, which is drier and colder, the alpine regions, and the Pacific side, which tends to be warmer. Animal life is abundant. You can observe grizzly bears, wolverines, mountain goats, bighorn sheep, moose, elk, mule deer, coyote, and on a rare occasion, a mountain lion. Glacier is known for its grizzly bear attacks, but only a few happen each year. It's always good to be cautious, so carry a can of bear spray if you venture out onto the 700 miles of hiking trails. Evidence for widespread glaciers is found throughout the park. 
you can easily spot the U-shaped valleys, glacial cirques, hanging valleys, moraines, and large outflow lakes. Be sure to look for these features as you explore the park. The rocks and glacier are supposed to be the best preserved Proterozoic sedimentary layers in the world, showcasing the Earth's most fruitful source for the record of early life, according to evolutionary thought. But the Bible indicates the Earth was created about 6,000 years ago using the genealogies found in Genesis and Matthew. So, how do we interpret the evidence for supposed long ages in the light of the biblical record? Let's see what the evidence really shows. Glacier National Park is in the Northern Rockies. The Rocky Mountains stretch from Northern Arizona all the way up into Canada. Most of the Rocky Mountains consist of sedimentary layers, meaning they were formed by water and underwater. There are also granite and volcanic rocks here as well. Some secular scientists say the Rockies we see today are the third generation of mountains after seas and erosion carved down the previous Rockies, leaving only a remnant of past mountain building. The Rockies we see today are thought to have formed over 1.6 billion to 800 million years ago by secular geologists. The top layer of strata in Glacier is called the Lewis Overthrust and is supposed to be from the Proterozoic period. There is a big problem here because according to the geologic column, the top layer is one and a half billion years older than the rocks below, which are from the Cretaceous Age. Because these layers are out of place according to the supposed geologic column, scientists have come up with a solution. They call it an overthrust. Overthrusts are thought to result from a geologic event where one rock layer is pushed up over another through tectonic activity over millions of years. Since we don't see this happening today and can't perform scientific experiments on such a massive geologic scale, secular scientists try to collect clues about what happened. Yet, these clues are viewed through their worldview of long ages and gradualism. Catastrophic processes, such as a worldwide flood, are not an option in their thinking. The Lewis Overthrust extends from Glacier National Park to 350 miles north. It is 15 to 30 miles wide, and the rocks are believed to have been thrust about 35 miles from their original location. We find these overthrusts throughout the mountain ranges of the world. The largest one is found in northern Wyoming and called the Heart Mountain Overthrust. If these formations are truly overthrust, millions of years old, what evidence should we see? Being that there are sedimentary layers both above and below, the sedimentary layer below would have to first harden into rock, then be pulled or pushed many miles over another sedimentary layer that formed into rock after it. Secular geologists say this happened over millions of years through slow and gradual processes. Yet, this tremendous geologic activity should show stress and friction on each layer being pushed or pulled over long distances and periods of time. At the contact point between the two layers, the rock should be ground up. In addition, where the layer was initially pushed, the rock should be compressed because it's taking all of the weight of the rock behind it but we don't find these compressed layers. With the supposed millions of years time scale secular scientists use, the coefficient of friction would have torn the layers apart. The coefficient of friction is an empirical measurement which describes the ratio of the force of friction between two bodies and the force pressing them together. But the contact point between the two layers is sharp and abrupt, not ground up. This is a telltale sign that the overthrust between these layers was formed by other geologic processes. If there's such a lack in physical evidence for the overthrust being formed over long ages, why do secular scientists continue to believe in it? Finally, if one layer was pushed, then all of the layers should show evidence of being pushed in the same direction. But this evidence is absent. It looks like only one layer was pushed because the fossils in the top layer appear to be more simple than the fossils in the bottom layer. If evolution were true, then we should find the opposite and more basic life forms on the bottom. 
Secular scientists promote the idea of an overthrust to explain why the fossils are out of order. The overthrust becomes their magic bullet to solve this dilemma. But as we pointed out, there is no evidence for an overthrust happening over millions of years. So how do we solve this problem? The Bible provides the answer to this dilemma. The key to understanding how the rocks and glacier were formed and much of the Rockies is found in the composition of their formations. They are mostly sedimentary rocks, which are formed by water and underwater. The lower layers are granite and metamorphic rocks, which could possibly be the rocks of creation. The Bible says that about 4,350 years ago, man had come to a point where every thought of his mind was evil and God was sorry that he made man. So he chose to destroy everything on the earth by water as a judgment against man's rebellion and sin. But there was one righteous man, Noah, along with his family, who God chose to save by warning him of the coming disaster and that he must build an ark to be saved. When the flood came, it was catastrophic. As promised, all life on earth was destroyed. After 150 days, the water covered the entire earth. The earth was going through tremendous geologic turmoil below the surface of the water. Giant tidal currents carried sand, silt, and mud across the globe, laying down many layers of sediment, in some places tens of thousands of feet thick. As water currents changed because of the geologic activity below, life forms were being buried in massive graves right within the soft sedimentary layers. As the flood reached its full height, the earth below began to rise in places as rock layers were pushed up, developing large mountains, which changed the worldwide flood currents. As mountains rose, the floodwaters began to fall away from the uplifting rock layers, first flowing in sheets, eroding thousands of feet of layers of soft sediment and depositing them into new ocean basins and elsewhere on the continents. Because of this rise of the mountains on the continents, entire layers of sediment miles wide could also have began sliding downhill by the simple force of gravity. Back in the 1950s, secular scientists proposed the idea of gravity slides to explain these out-of-place layers. But then, in the 1960s, those scientists changed to believe that slow plate tectonics caused these features because they like to believe in slow, gradual processes. They choose to ignore the data, which supported gravity slides. But creation scientists have brought back the idea of catastrophic gravity slides, or superfaults, to explain how these massive layers of rock were put into place. First of all, as we established, solid rock cannot easily be pushed. It breaks apart when moved. In order for these layers to move and stay together, unbroken, they would have to be relatively soft at the time they were moved. There were only two times in history where these layers could have been relatively soft, during the creation week and during the flood. Since these layers in glacier are upper layers, they're from the time of the flood. During the flood, water could have been trapped under some of the sediment layers. This water would have been under tremendous pressure. Studies have shown that if a sediment layer is tilted at at least two degrees and there is water under high pressure underneath this layer, the layer will begin to slide downhill due to gravity. The process of compressed water making heavy objects slide is similar to waterboarding at the beach. Waterboarding is taking a thin board, throwing it across a thin sheet of water, then running and sliding on top of it. If you tried waterboarding on dry sand, it would be disastrous. But when a thin layer of water is put between the board and the sand with the pressure of you on top, you can glide for many feet. When the mountains were rising at the end stages of the flood, layers of sediment would have glided across the landscape in a similar way. After the layers stopped sliding and settled down, the rock layers further hardened. Sediment layers from the beginning of the flood, which contained the earliest buried animals, would have been put on top of layers that had fossils which died later in the flood. It would appear that they are out of place. 
Another creationist discovery for the quick superfaulting of these layers is a thin layer of metamorphic silicate glass found between the layers. This glass can only be formed by frictional melting with temperatures exceeding 1000 degrees Celsius. It is believed that this glass can only occur with high speed movement between rock layers. Evidence for slow moving rock layers has already been shown to be impossible. But this glass points clearly to a catastrophic process going on during the time of the flood. In its truest sense, the formation here at Glacier was an overthrust, only it happened catastrophically in just days below the waters. Geologically speaking, this is called gravity tectonics. Other overthrusts around the world would have been forming around the same time. In fact, when one gravity slide happens, it triggers others around the same area. And suddenly, you have a catastrophic domino effect happening under the floodwaters. Eventually, the floodwaters became less. Instead of sheet erosion, the water channelized, eroding large valleys, such as seen at Glacier. Eventually, all water emptied into the oceans. Additional erosion and massive settling of the Earth's surface continued after the flood, carving out these valleys even more. Even though we don't yet understand all the details about the geologic processes happening during the global flood, the biblical model makes much more sense of what we find in the mountain formations around the world. Science, it's awesome. What we've seen here at Glacier so far is how the layers are amazing and what the flood did here. But what this national park is really known for is how the Ice Age left its mark in these valleys. Evidence for the Ice Age was discovered in the mid 1800s. What scientists observed were large U-shaped valleys and moraines. U-shaped valleys are formed when an ice sheet moves down a valley, eroding the valley walls and valley bottom. We can still observe this happening today in glaciated areas of the world. Moraines are caused by a moving glacier. As the ice moves down a valley, the weight of the glacier pushes rocks and debris to the side or out in front of it. This material is called lateral moraines and terminal or end moraines. Some people doubt there was an ice age, but the evidence is all around us. When secular scientists first discovered evidence for an ice age, it didn't fit their uniformitarian view because uniformitarianism says that the processes we see today are the ones that happened in the past. And we don't see ice ages forming today, do we? These scientists observed evidence for at least one ice age, but had no idea how quickly it formed or melted. Because they believe in long ages, they guessed an ice age would last 100,000 years and just one ice age didn't seem reasonable. They then discovered supposed evidence in the moraines and ocean sediments for many ice ages spanning over 2 million years. They claim that we have seen at least four major ice ages and some scientists even suggest our distant past included ice everywhere, calling it Snowball Earth. Secular scientists say that the last ice age occurred around 10,000 years ago, but what does the evidence really show? They also say that we're due for another ice age soon, but they really don't have a clue about how it develops in the first place. So, what elements do you need for an ice age? The primary elements you need are abundant moisture, mild winters, and cool summers. Let's take a look at each one of these. Abundant moisture usually comes from our oceans, especially warm oceans. Most of our large storms and hurricanes come from the equatorial regions where the water is extremely warm. But to develop the vast amounts of moisture to create an ice age would require much warmer oceans worldwide. Next, you need mild winters. If winters are too cold, the air cannot hold moisture and therefore it can't snow. We see this in the Arctic, where temperatures get into the sub-zero level and snowfall is absent. When we say mild winters, we're not saying winters above freezing, just winters about 20 or 30 degrees below freezing. Finally, you need cool summers. How do you get that? The answer might surprise you. 
mechanisms such as volcanoes can put ash and aerosols into the atmosphere and cause global cooling for short periods of time. This cooling usually lasts just a couple of years from one major event. For instance, Mount Pinatubo's massive eruption in 1991 caused the Earth's average temperature to drop by a degree or two for many months. If several large eruptions happened simultaneously around the Earth, the effect would be much greater. But to create consistently cool summers worldwide, you would need large volcanic activity for several decades. There is evidence to support this idea because we find signs of global volcanic activity in the Earth's recent past. This evidence includes many extinct supervolcanoes, huge ash beds, and gigantic lava flows found throughout the world. Secular scientists guess this volcanic activity happened a long time ago, possibly millions of years, because historical records do not record worldwide supervolcanic activity. Yet, a good indication of a recent explosive past is Yellowstone's supervolcano. Geysers, mud pots, and steam pour out of this location today. There is even talk of a huge eruption happening in the near future. If supervolcanoes died out millions of years ago, then the Yellowstone caldera should be extinct, but it's not. We continue to see volcanoes erupt today, but not at the same level as in the past. Big eruptions today only cause minor global cooling. When all three of these conditions happen together, abundant moisture, mild winters, and cool summers, you could have a rapidly building ice age. In the uniformitarian model, it would be very difficult to generate these conditions at the same time for just one ice age, not to mention many others. Every computer model they have run doesn't work. It puts ice in the wrong places, cools down the wrong places, or doesn't produce the right amount of ice. This is a major problem. In addition, the few evidences they use to prove multiple ice ages could be interpreted as due to other geologic processes. For instance, they use evidence in moraines to claim that one ice age pushed materials along, then the ice melted. Another ice age developed and pushed the moraine around a bit more. This supposedly happened many times with one moraine. But we can observe today how glaciers advance and recede, producing similar features to what secular scientists say is evidence of many ice ages. Yet it was only one glacier that caused it. As far as the chemical variations in seafloor sediments go, the evidence is very imprecise when trying to prove they are from multiple ice ages. Other geologic factors could have been at work. Since no one was there to observe and record these events happening, their ideas are just presumptions. This sketchy guesswork is why they have over 60 models for an ice age because none of them fully explain how even one ice age could have occurred using current observable conditions. But there is one event in the past that could easily have created the right conditions for one major ice age, the global flood of Noah's day. As Bible-believing creationists, we have a good answer for how the ice age formed. During the global flood, the Earth was going through catastrophic global changes. At the beginning of the flood, the Bible says the fountains of the great deep burst forth. This included warm subterranean water from within the Earth's crust, which was ejected onto the surface. In addition, the fountains of the great deep included molten lava. Although the Bible does not speak of them specifically, some creation scientists have found evidence that the flood could have involved meteorites entering the Earth's atmosphere. These events would have added heat to the Earth's waters. Finally, large-scale catastrophic tectonic activity would have caused friction. The water on top of the tectonic plates would have heated up dramatically as the plates were subducted rapidly. All of these processes would have warmed the floodwaters to a very high temperature by the end of the flood. Seafloor sediments indicate the waters were much warmer in the past around the entire Earth. Estimates for ocean temperatures worldwide could have risen to at least 90 degrees Fahrenheit or even higher. 
These warm waters would have existed worldwide for hundreds of years after the flood. These conditions would have caused tremendous evaporation, resulting in very large precipitation near the shores and snowstorms in the higher latitudes. We can look to the Gulf of Mexico every summer to see how warm waters grow large hurricanes. As storms move out of Africa and into the Atlantic, they increase in power. As they hit the Gulf, these storms can build up very quickly into large hurricanes because of the near 90 degree surface water temperatures. In the same way, worldwide warmth of the oceans right after the flood would have caused massive storms across entire continents. Most of the mountain chains we see today show evidence of them rising quickly during and after the flood. The massive storms moving across these mountains would have dumped large amounts of snow in these regions and the snowpacks would have eventually turned into ice sheets. In current weather patterns, we see how the Gulf of Mexico produces storms during the winter months, which move north into the Midwest, creating large snowstorms. Of course, the snow does not stick around because we have hot and humid summers. But with mild winters and cool summers after the flood, the snow would have accumulated quickly in the mountains and not melted off. This snow and ice would have eventually filled the valleys and created large ice sheets over the northern and southern continents. Some estimates from creation scientists are that huge ice sheets could have accumulated in two to 300 years, starting within decades after the flood. But some say it takes tens of thousands of years to build up ice sheets that thick. Think again. During World War II, a squadron of six P-38s and two B-17 bombers had to crash land on top of Greenland's ice sheets. None of the crew was lost and they were all rescued and returned safely home after spending several days on the desolate ice. In the 1980s, a team of ambitious historians decided to go back and find these planes and bring them home. They assumed the job would be fairly easy because they made the assumption that ice does not accumulate quickly. They were wrong. This assumption was made because secular scientists tell us it takes thousands or even millions of years to develop an ice sheet. When an ice core is examined from Greenland or Antarctica, it is thought that each distinct layer of ice is one year of accumulation. But different processes may have been at work. Creation scientists have suggested that each layer is an individual storm, not a year's worth of accumulation. After several failed attempts at finding the planes near the surface, they eventually located them much further down. In fact, they were buried under 250 feet of ice. They eventually brought back one complete P-38, and it now flies at air shows throughout the country. This is just one example showing that it doesn't take long ages to build up an ice pack, just the right conditions. With the meteorological conditions right after the flood, building the ice age quickly was not a problem. If it took only two to 300 years for the ice age to form, how quickly did it melt? There is evidence all over the earth that the ice age melted catastrophically. We know that as warm water evaporates, the oceans would cool down over time. You will notice this mechanism when you come out of a warm swimming pool. The water will evaporate off your body and you'll feel cold. As the oceans cooled through the few hundred years of the ice age, the amount of evaporation decreased and fewer big storms developed. The earth was also settling down from catastrophic geologic processes. So there was less ash in the atmosphere and the summers began to warm up. Instead of increasing in depth, the ice sheets started to melt. Estimates are that the main ice sheets would have melted in only 50 to 70 years. What evidence is there to support such an incredibly short number? Around the earth, there is evidence for massive lakes formed by the melting ice sheets. In several places, this water was blocked by huge ice dams. Eventually, these dams melted, broke loose, and caused large regional floods. This happened in the Pacific Northwest with the Missoula Flood. Glaciers in the Rockies melted at the end of the Ice Age, developing a massive lake. Shorelines thousands of feet high can be seen around Missoula, Montana. 
The ice dam holding back this lake was near Sand Point, Idaho. The dam broke open and caused a huge flood across western Washington, the Columbia Gorge, and the Willamette Valley in Oregon. For years, secular geologists refused to believe that such a large regional flood could have occurred. How do we know this happened? Today, we can view huge ripple marks, water lines thousands of feet high, and observe channeled scab lands across multiple states in the Pacific Northwest. We can also find boulders that were caught up in the ice and carried hundreds of miles by this flood, then deposited downstream. They are called erratic boulders. For example, an erratic boulder is found in the Willamette Valley near McMinnville, Oregon. This type of rock does not exist in this part of Oregon, but does in Montana. The only explanation is that it was carried here by the Missoula flood in an iceberg. We find erratic boulders all over the world, so we know this type of massive melt-off happened quickly on every continent. These massive floods would have put large amounts of fresh water on the surface of the ocean near the continents. Fresh water is less dense than salt water, so it would have kept on top of the salt water for a while. With the cooler ocean worldwide, the winters would have been colder and this fresh water would have frozen quickly near the Arctic, developing ice sheets on top of the oceans. This would have stopped any remaining evaporation, perpetuating even colder winters with no snow. Another evidence for a quick melt-off of the Ice Age is over-deepened lakes. This here is Lake McDonald. It was formed by a glacier and it's 427 feet deep. These types of over-deepened lakes are found throughout the world at the base of mountains where glaciers existed during and after the Ice Age. One of these larger lakes is Lake Chelan, found in northeastern Washington state. It is over 50 miles long. It is almost 1,500 feet deep. Its deepest point is almost 500 feet below sea level. Some massive erosional event carved this lake. It is traditionally thought that as a glacier moves down a valley, it carves deep troughs. When a glacier eventually melts, it leaves these over-deepened lakes. But new evidence has shown other methods may have been at work here. We've seen the meltwater from a glacier move underneath the ice. This flow can especially be large when there's a lot of ice melting. When the water flows beneath the ice, it carries debris along with it like rocks and sand. Because of the pressure above from the ice and the moving debris in the water, the hydraulic properties of moving water become powerful in its erosional force. As the water moved to the exit point, it cut the Earth's surface below the ice, then developed low pressure gaps. The ice would then cave in, pushing the water towards the Earth more and the erosion would go deeper. When the ice was completely gone, the deeply eroded valley would fill in with water. After studying this evidence, it's obvious an ice age does not take tens of thousands of years to come and go, but can happen very quickly, all within less than 400 years. Secular scientists say that ice ages are a reoccurring event. So, are we gonna have another one? Secular scientists guess that the Ice Ages lasted around 100,000 years, with gaps of 10,000 years in between each one. The last Ice Age was supposed to have ended about 10,000 years ago. So according to their numbers, we're about due for another one anytime. Hollywood movies have predicted this as well, but it just isn't the case. The fact is, excluding the flood, Secular scientists really don't have a clue about what causes ice ages. If man ignores the biblical flood, then he loses all hope for knowing what caused the ice age. If he thinks they just happen over and over with no real scientific basis for how it all began, then they are just speculating that it will happen again. We know it won't happen because there will never be another global flood. This was God's promise. What the flood and subsequent ice age show us is that God is serious about his judgments. As you continue to tour Glacier National Park, you will see just a few glaciers left in the high elevations. A hundred years ago, there were 150 known glaciers in the park, 
now only 37 remain, and only 25 are considered active glaciers. An active glacier is a glacier that is considered at least 25 acres in size. This decrease in glaciers is seen worldwide and has accelerated since 1980. Based on current melting rates, it's estimated that all glaciers in the park will disappear by 2020. It's true, there have been many changes in our climate over the last several decades, but these changes depend on many factors. Back in the 1970s, scientists were afraid that we were entering a global cooling phase, but it didn't continue. The Earth seems to go back and forth in cooling and heating throughout the generations. Some scientists blame man for global warming and the melting of glaciers, but there are many more powerful mechanisms which could cause our world's climate to change. Back in the 1600s to the 1800s, the world went through the Little Ice Age, where glaciers advanced and summer crops failed. We now know this was caused by sunspots and volcanism, not man. When the ice sheets were building and melting after the flood, climate changes were happening on a much more dramatic scale. There is evidence the ancient cultures were working hard to protect themselves from this changing climate. Some might have tried to prevent these changes in climate, like some do today. We don't have all the data. But what we have found is that man's influence is minimal on the climate. Thankfully, God has built our Earth to rebound from these influences. Forests around the world are now growing at amazing rates because they absorb carbon dioxide and other man-made gases. The oceans are full of diatoms, which also take in the bad gases and give back good ones. Our atmosphere's ozone layer isn't being impacted by man-made gases either. The growth of giant holes in the ozone layer has been proven to be caused by other natural factors. It's true, God put man in charge of the earth and to take care of it. We should be wise stewards, but there is a misguided campaign to say that man is destroying the earth. God loves us and he is in control of all living things. We need to be aware that there are other spiritual forces at work which are using the global warming debate as a means to push their own agenda, which does not include honoring God or His Word. We know the future of our world. It will be destroyed by fire in God's final judgment against man, and there is nothing we can do to stop it. But God has provided a way out of His judgment. He loves man and desires to have a relationship with him. But we are sinful creatures and cannot fellowship with God because he is holy and we are not. Our sin and rebellion against God deserves the penalty of death. Yet, God made a way for us to escape the judgment by sending his own son, Jesus Christ. Because Jesus is God's son, he is perfect without sin. He died in our place, taking the punishment for mankind's sin. Only by repenting of our sin and believing in this gift of salvation through what Jesus did for us on the cross will we be able to escape his judgment and enter into fellowship with God forever. We encourage you to repent of your sin and come to salvation today before God's final judgment comes. Glacier is a great place to see the evidence for a global flood in the massive layers that have been exposed in the park. We also see how the overthrusts show incredible geologic activity during the flood. We've also seen how the flood provided the right conditions to start and maintain the ice age. It didn't take many ice ages in millions of years to create what we see at Glacier National Park, but the ice age happened rapidly, then melted off catastrophically. Because the one and only flood provided the right conditions for the ice age, the prediction of another ice age is just blind speculation. We can trust in God's word to help us interpret the past and to use it as a guide to Earth's history. When we use God's word, things begin to make sense about what we find in nature. Thank you for watching this episode of Awesome Science. And remember, science it's awesome.